Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, Jair Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. Without further ado... All right. So thank you for coming back for another episode of the Sci-Fi Shenanigans podcast. So today we want to, before we introduce our guest, we want to introduce this little mini series of episodes we're going to do for the next three is what's planned right now. So we wanted to talk about the lit RPG genre. Um, So we're going to start by introducing the genre with an author, and and then we're going to do two interviews of of rabid fans of the the genre. All of these questions will be geared... um, towards that so stay tuned for the next for this three-part series if there are people in the subgenre of sci-fi lit rpg that you want us to talk to uh we'll give our contact information at the end of this podcast and reach out i am not afraid to be told no so i don't care how big and famous they are you tell me who and i'll send a question i don't care um and why lit rpg because well People talk about it. Nobody seems to know exactly what it officially is, and I was curious. So mount up. We ride on this quest to learn about the genre, um, and we'll ask Jason about the mysterious new subgenre and then transition into spe- his specific book that fits the world of lit RPG. Jason Cordova is a Navy veteran, an author, and 2014 John W. Campbell Award finalist, has traveled exclusively throughout the extensively not exclusively extensively throughout the u.s and the world he has published multiple novels and been featured in over 30 books as a contributor in one capacity or another he coaches high school varsity basketball loves the outdoors and used to be a professional video game player and professional wrestler who currently (laughs) lives in virginia although i should have put the virginia part first because after professional video game player and wrestler where he lives sort of felt (laughs) anticlimactic This is why we have editors, people. So, were you a pinball wizard? Uh, God, no! I wish pinball pinball is so so much more fun. No, I uh, I played on a game called World of Tanks in the Bronze and Silver League a couple years ago. Oh yeah, World of Tanks. That's fun. So, how much did they pay you for playing that? Did you make a penny and call yourself a professional? No, actually, I was I was the backup player for a team that went to the World Championships in uh, Poland. But I ended up not getting chosen. I was pretty much on their practice squad for the season. Cool. See, I know yeah. that professional gaming exists, but other than that, I don't know much about it. It's uh, it's a weird world. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if, if I were a professional at World of Tanks, I'd probably be in the bread mold league. <laughs> right about well, there. I just did what I was told, which was go here, shoot this guy, try not to die. Usually I was the dummy. They put me in the scout tank at the bottom tier and – I went ahead and I snuck around the edges and took snipe shots. Fun stuff. <laughs> All right. So if you want to know more about professional video game playing, he'll con- his contact information will be at the end. And if World of Tanks wants to sponsor this episode, you know how to reach us. All right. So oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the other part of the uh, introduction is we talk about how we met the guest uh sometimes that's going to be as simple as uh google but this time i actually found jason when his publisher was looking for beta readers for his first book in the ken wars saga wraith ken um and we sort of just stayed in touch after that um i've even reviewed the book on my blog so i will list that in the show notes Uh, it was a four-star book it was excellent um, most of the reason it didn't get the fifth star was more, and I list that in the description, was my preferences as a reader as opposed to anything structurally wrong with the book. It happens. Tastes may vary. Um, and so, like I said, we, we just sort of kept in touch. What about you, Chris? Did you uh, find him independently of me? I'd like to say I found him because I used to spar against him in wrestling, but that would be an outright lie. But like everybody else worth no- worth knowing, I may whom through JR, and that's how I heard about him the first time. Okay, well, you should definitely read the the Wraithkin. He does interesting things with uh, powered armor that that I hadn't seen before, Ooh. and haven't seen since. Okay, that's yeah, another one on the list. Well, I tried not to do it. Like I, w- I tried to stay away from the whole powered armor focus and more on the basic story, which was a love story. I mean. It's nice. what it is. It's a love story at heart. Well, I mean, 
So with Starship Troopers, it's a man in his his powered armor. I mean, I love my powered armor too, don't you? Yeah, true. <laughs> hmm. So the um, the really, I, I was a. Um, and I don't think I've mentioned this before, but I was a political science was one of my majors in college. So sometimes I get real uh, picky about that. In fact, uh, Chris and I were outlining a new world together and we spent about an hour back and forth because I based so much of it on what I knew has happened for real. And sometimes that gets in the way. So like I said, your mileage may vary. It was an excellent story, but uh, that's not what we're here to talk about today. So. So Jason, what do you love about science fiction? Oh, um, it, a lot of it is the hope, the the dreams. You know, I'm I wasn't a huge science fiction fan growing up. I know this is blasphemy, but I'd never heard of Heinlein until about I'd say ten years ago. I'd never heard of Robert Heinlein ever. I'd heard Asimov because there was a magazine named after him, but science fiction wasn't my ballywick. And I was, you know, I was just like, okay, whatever, rolling through, reading, 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 and then I discovered uh, Kevin J. Anderson and Timothy Zahn. And they were so mm-hmm. fascinating. And then I just got this mentality of, yeah, you know, I like it when the good guys in, when there's a satisfactory ending to the story. Yeah, it might take six, eight, nine, 20 books to get there, but there is a satisfactory end where everybody, as a reader, you get what you want out of it. And that's what I love about science fiction more so than fantasy or even, well, especially horror. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. There's, there's usually there's, not a good yeah. ending there. Right. Well, I mean, the Undertakers so, yeah, always just, always make out in a in an ending for a horror novel. And the tax collector does too, but <laughs> that's right. The inheritance oh, tax. Right. What what's your first memory of of sci fi? Was it a movie, a book? Um, what 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 first got you turned on to the genre? I'm kind of young. I didn't realize it was science. It was science fiction. It's just you know Star Wars. Obviously, hmm. you know I was what I was. I was. One year old, I uh, know. I wasn't born yet, actually, when the first one came out. And I think I was one when the second came out. You young whippersnapper. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> and, um, you know, my fir- earliest memories of was Star Wars. Uh, not so much Star Trek. Uh, some of the, the horrible uh, the horrible Ewok movie. Um, the Jedi, oh, I the missed Christmas that one. Christmas. Yeah, I still haven't what? seen any, any of the Ewok movies. Oh, <laughs> everybody That's talks crazy. about it like it causes trauma. I'm so lucky. Not, man. It wasn't bad. It just, it was not what I was expecting. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I was, ex- I was expecting Luke Skywalker. I got wicked on drugs. So, you know, I wanted an Ewok as a pet. <laughs> I, got, I used to call my little sister an Ewok and she got so mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> no idea. Strange. <laughs> So, so, how, so how did your love of science fiction turn into writing science fiction? How did you first get started with that? Oh, okay. Um, I wrote Corruptor. Well, really, let me rewind that a little bit. I read an article about the University of Chicago was starting to treat uh, veterans and people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder using the uh, virtual reality helmets. Ooh. And I thought, that's a really cool idea. You know, that's a brilliant way to treat people. I mean, I, would th- I think I was 27, 28 at the time when they were doing this. And I started reading more into it. And then um, I met Travis Taylor, uh, an author from Bain. I'm sorry, Dr. Travis Taylor, an author at Bain Books uh, at a convention where I told him he was flat wrong and being an idiot. Ah, always a way to make <laughs> yeah. friends. Always away. Well, that was the same one I call John Ringo a blathering moron. Uh-huh. So, you know, I know how to – always that first good foot, you know. <laughs> and um, he wrote it, He wrote this book called Quantum Connection, which it's okay. It's not the greatest. Uh, he, he's he got – his earlier books are really rough around the edges. His later stuff's much better. But uh, he wrote – he in it, he wrote this uh, – he wrote about something called The Realm, I believe it was called. And it was this fascinating idea about, you know, a virtual reality world where people can go in and make money and kill each other. And it was great, you know, and I thought, well, I could do that too. (laughs) Make money and kill people? Yeah, you know, without like going to jail for it. (laughs) Let's add that caveat in just in case the FBI is listening again. Oh, they listen. They listen. (laughs) 
Oh, they're always listening. <laughs> <laughs> they're listening. My toaster's listening. I know. I'm on to them. <laughs> but that's pretty much how I uh, I went from I like Star I like Star Wars to I like video games to I want to write books about video games. And then that was when Corruptor was born. So normally we start off asking the the all important religion question: Star Wars, Star Trek, Brown Coat. Uh, but you answered it correct, correctly, so we don't have to do that today, and we get to keep you on the podcast. <laughs> Just say that. Woohoo! Ooh, take That's my hand off the kick button. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so who's been the largest influence in your writing? Uh, well, I've already, uh, three people and they're all, the nice thing about becoming an author is you go to conventions, you meet them and they would call me their friend. Whereas I'm sitting here, I'm total fanboy when it comes to, uh, my first one was, uh, Timothy Zahn met him, loved him. He's a great guy. Kind of short though. I was really surprised. Hmm. And, uh, I actually, I fanboyed him when I met him at a, at a convention in the South eight years ago. I, I felt like a goober. I ran up. I gave him a hug. I was like, oh, my God, you're Timothy Zahn. You may be a writer. The guys look at me like, uh, security? Security? <laughs> <laughs> and But now he's a great guy. We've kept in touch over the years. And I love I, – I mean, just terrific writer. And then um, – but not for the series that everybody thinks, though. I, um, I don't know if you've heard of his Conqueror's Heritage trilogy or the Conqueror's trilogy. That's what got me into Timothy Zahn, not his Star Wars, Heir of the Empire. Wow, okay. So if you ever get a chance, look that one up. It's very, very well done. We will. Okay. And then uh, my second uh, influence is John Ringo. Uh, you know, met him at a convention, called him an idiot. Yeah. We've uh, we've been good friends since. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensing a theme and, here. And uh, me... Yeah, yeah. And then the, my third is David Weber, um, his Honor Arrington series. I, that's the hard science fiction I read where I was just like, wow, that's that's science fiction. That, that's amazing. And, you know, David's a great guy. He's he's really helped me out over the years, given me some pointers. Him and Sharon both have just been out, outstanding supporters. And every time I have a question, they're willing to answer it. Okay. I just think of that. That's one of the things I really like about about some books I read. If I put it down and I realize I've learned something, you know, that, that I understand yeah, I, it better. No, I'm not going to get you. Don't get me wrong. There's points in some of his books where my eyes kind of glaze over because he goes, he goes math porn. And I just <laughs> kind of, I'm going to scroll ahead a little bit and, uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Dialogue. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, uh, wow, math. Ugh. I hated that in high school, but, you know, it's necessary sometimes. Um, so, you obviously, we know what you like about science fiction and how you evolved into writing your own. But how did you throw your hat in the ring and write the lit RPG novels that, that are the, the Warp series? Like, what made you say, you know what, I want to try this new thing, lit RPG? Oh, um, it was an accident. Um, I wanted to write about video games, but, you know, I didn't know at the time that they had serialization contracts and they were looking for authors. I tried to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I tried to uh, get in with a couple of different publishing houses who do specific uh, video game adaptations like, uh, you know, Halo, those things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I wasn't quite a big enough author, you know, because I'd never written anything at that point, so... You know, I can understand their skepticism of my claims of, hey, I'll write a book for you. <laughs> so I just had decided, you know what, I'm going to make my own. And that was the warp. Okay. Yeah. So did you set out to make it as RPG? I mean, lit RPG, was that what you were doing when you wrote it? I wanted to write a story about a video game and a video world where the one rule, which I hate, I hate this in video games, and I'm sorry if I'm getting sidetracked here. I hate that people can just run out there on their video games, die, know what's there, and just go back to the last save point and do it again. <laughs> it, it drove me nuts. So I wanted a world where you die, you get punished. Like your character is completely deleted. You got to start all the way over again. Okay. 
So, and so people you, they in this RP in this uh, lit RPG world, they have to use they have to work together and try to avoid conflict and find different ways around it. Now, conflict is a huge part of the game, but it's not something you're just going to run into a middle of a bar room, open up with two M60s on each arm, and you know hope for the best. Hmm. Spray and pray. It's a good approach. Yeah. But there's there's better rewards for manipulating somebody else to do it for you. I mean, oh, it works sure. for Rambo, uh-huh. Schwarzenegger. I mean, John – was it uh, John – oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Nagagomi's Towers. Uh, the greatest Christmas movie of all times. John McClane. McClane. Yeah. There we go. I almost said McCain, but I know that's not yeah. it. He's the pretender to the, uh, <laughs> to the war hero that was John McClane. <laughs> but okay. But yeah, so um, – I, we all like the explosion, so it seems like that is part of your motivation. You just wanted a different twist on it. I wanted something that people had never seen before. I mean, at this point, back when I was uh, – some of the other bigger names that are out now, like um, uh, I guess Ready Player One would be the other only other big example I could think of. Uh, it hadn't come out yet, so I was I was the first one out there. Which is always fun to get asked by other people, what's it feel like to rip off uh, Peter Cl- or Peter Klein's? Sounds right, yeah. I don't even know who wrote it. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel to rip him off? I was like, well, technically, my book came out a year before his, so I didn't uh-huh. rip him off. He ripped you off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a story we're sticking with. <clears throat> so, to do play RPGs is... Uh, yeah. And how yeah, does that work, um, in, work into your books is just, just the fact that you don't, you don't like that players can run ahead and see what's there and then take their time the second time? Or, and how does that factor in? Well... If you mean RPGs on video games, uh, I strictly, I strictly, wow, hmm. I strictly stick to uh, mostly world building. I, I love Civilization. I love those type of games. Um, I used to play World of Warcraft like extensively. Um, I actually am now one of the. I was one of the original beta players for Shroud of the Avatar, which is uh, Richard Gere's uh, new MMO online so i got to play that some and I, I still play it a little bit but most of it's just uh it doesn't get into my books whatsoever because there aren't really any good science fiction rpg games out there for the computer hmm. not at this time there used to be some like i think there was a shadow run game a few years back but there's just nothing really out there right now yeah it seems to mostly be fantasy right now huh it's been fantasy. Uh, I, I blame uh, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and uh, George R. R. Martin for that. <laughs> All right. So um, did you know when you started that um, that you were telling a lit RPG story to like the as far as the genre itself? Was that something you were aware of or were you just telling your story? And oh, by the way, it fits. Uh, up until you guys contacted me, I never heard of the lit RPG. Oh, wow. I will not. I never heard of the genre or anything. If someone says, yeah, you write lit RPG. I was like, no, I don't. I mean, I even asked my publisher, I said, what, what's lit RPG? And I think I accidentally tagged you in that email. Cause I agreed to the, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure. We, we had put a call out for, for some of the author groups that we know, some of the smaller ones, so we weren't bombarded with a million people. For anybody that did Lit RPG, because we were doing this series, like ultimately we want to do one of these little mini-series for a lot of the um, more popular subgenres of sci-fi, anything that people send us. And so we thought we'd start with Lit RPG, and because a friend of ours had asked us to co-write a, in, in this world that didn't the timing didn't work, but in the process, your publisher, Chris Kennedy reached out and he's like, Hey, Jason Cordova, who you beta read for, he writes a lit RPG series. And, you know, why don't you interview him about it? And you, so he tags you in that email and you're like, uh, what I did. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like an idiot. Cause I had no idea what he was talking about. I'm like, I, I, I messed him. I'm like, Hey Chris, what's lit RPGs? Like you write it. I'm like, okay, that that's not helpful. I, I don't understand. <laughs> He actually, uh, Jason's book is listed, the Warp series. The Lit RPG, I, I looked on Amazon. It's not actually a subcategory, although it is, if that makes sense. Like everyone knows what it is, but it's not listed by Amazon. A lot of them are listed, the sci-fi version of that genre, the subgenre, are listed as cyberpunk, which is what the Warp series is listed as. Oh, it is? Oh, huh. Okay. But I- uh, <laughs> cyberpunk fans get a little irritated about that because it's like, it's not really cyberpunk. 
So uh, they're going to end up with. The, no, I understand. We'll that. see. Amazon is. They, they're going to end up with a million subgenres, so they're they're probably hesitant to to spread it out. But after Ready Player One, I would think, and, and Control Alt Revolt, mm-hmm. and some of the uh, fantasy ones, a lot of the lit RPG I found, which was part of the difficulty in setting this up, were people that were more fantasy based. So that end up in sort of a Tolkien esque uh, Lord of the Rings type world where it's sword and shield and, and whatnot, which is fine. I'd read those too, but that's not the point of this podcast. Right. Well, I mean, I, I um, um, part of the whole thing about the warp, which I love was you can have your sword in one hand. You can have a 50 caliber in the under, if you, in the uh, other, if you can wield it hmm. together, you can use magic with guns. That was the whole fun of the warp. I can do whatever I wanted. Okay. I like it. I can dig it. So uh, what specifically about this, um, this style of storytelling, um, do you do you like uh what what is it specifically that draw you, drew you to the video game stories oh just i was just the idea of launching a character 100 feet in the air raining down on your opponent with magic landing in the middle of the group pull out a desert eagle shooting someone in the head and running off <laughs> i just the idea of that was just so cool i was like yeah let's do that so you're writing the book of the movie you would like to see Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. I. I. So, as you were speaking it, I saw it all in my head, and I thought, I'd like to see that movie. Yes, I would. <laughs> yes, and okay. I. I wanted so, to have a a female character in there who was really, really, you know, she's a teenager, and you most. I hate to say it, most female characters I've seen done by both men and women tend to forget the teenager part, and they're going straight to the woman part. And I know women, girls want to grow up fast, but sometimes you get the girl who just, you know, she's not ready to grow up yet. She likes her video games. She likes being in high school. She's enjoying being a kid. Yeah. And that's Tori from the warp. So do you think at any point in time that um, an RPG or a video game or whatever that uh, that your series has a good fit for something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could see I could see it going different places really it just it depends on who's gonna throw the most money at me yeah (laughs) so now when i asked about rpgs and you answered for the computer so we went with it but i'm gonna rephrase that question um, and ask specifically so do you also play like some of the tabletop uh role-playing games not the computer ones but something like a Dungeons and dragons starfinder oh yeah something like that oh yeah uh, i belong to a group that had the uh, same continuous game for three years i believe Wow. Um, nice. And he's one of the the guy who runs it is actually one of my first readers, and he's the most insane individual I've ever run across in my life. Like we were sitting there, we're chasing uh I think it was the prophets of Pennywise, uh the guys from the insane clown posse across this desert world, <laughs> and they love puns. So, you know, we had this Bear, this land shark swimming around in the ground chasing us, but it had three barrels behind dragging behind it on the surface. And he stole that from Jaws, and it's just—he's the most creative, insane individual I've ever met. And I love—I love playing his games because he just—he'll mess with you. He just for fun. Oh, fun! So, is there—is there a preferred? Um, like, do you do the fantasy RPGs, the more of the um, space themed ones? Most of it tends to be um, modern day fantasy. The way the rules for D and D are written right now, you can take a spell and turn it into whatever you want. Just, you know, you can describe it to have the effects be one thing. Like instead of a burst lightning spell, you're like, I'm going to throw a grenade. Same effect. You can, and you can manipulate it however you want, which is what uh, we like to do. So you basically okay. use the, the Dungeons and Dragons rules for your own urban worlds. Yes. Okay. I'm learning about this because um, well, one, my, my son's, um, he's autistic. His therapist, his ABA therapist recommended getting him into something like RPGs because he likes Skyrim. So it's like forces that social interaction. And then the more I started looking into it, I'm like, man, this is kind of fun for me too. So I, I'm sort of noticing everything's out there. And then we learned about the GURPS system because we just interviewed um, CJ Carella. So I'm like learning about all of this. But since it's it's literary and it's sci-fi, I mean, it's what we promised the listeners we'd talk about. So Anyway, now does that tabletop gaming affect the stories you come up with? 
Not typically. I I try to keep them separate because I don't because like I said, uh, Jay likes to steal from pop culture and everything like that. So I try to keep a, a distance between the two because otherwise, I'll get people yelling at me for taking stuff that isn't mine. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Well, I'm, that's fair. I get that. I mean, uh, you don't want to being inspired by something and copying it are not necessarily the same things, but uh, so you, you obviously don't want to copy it, but do, is, does any of what happens inspires what becomes something that you create? Oh, uh, occasionally not very, I try to, like I said, I try to keep a clean break there. Uh, I've done stuff in my character has done stuff in the game where I said, you know what? That's cool. I'm going to use that. And then later on I write it out because like, eh, it doesn't really fit. Cause my usually, uh, yeah, yeah. I typically, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking you, I you just don't use, want to shoehorn stuff in, right? Right. I typically use characters that are a little on the insane side. Okay, they're <laughs> very much on the sa- insane side. And as fun as they are to write about, they don't sell well. Hmm. Okay. I can see that. I'm All right. At, well, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I'm looking at uh, my books right now that I've written in... Uh, there's one, there's one I don't see listed on here where I actually use someone who's mildly insane, and uh, it didn't sell very well. But it was a lot of fun to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that's always something. Obviously, yeah. you want to at least recoup the cost of cover and editing. But you know, if you had fun, that's got value in itself. Okay. So before we transition to speaking specifically in, about the warp, instead of sort of asking him about what he thinks about lit RPG, let's take a moment for a word from our sponsor. Fifty years ago, Mira, humankind's last hope to find new resources, departed the solar system. Seven years into her mission, she disappeared. She has returned. SNR Black, a Seoul Federation Marine Corps vessel, is sent to retrieve her from certain destruction in the Kuiper Belt beyond Pluto. What they find will change humankind forever. From Parsec award-winning author Paul E. Cooley, Derelict, Marines, Part 1 of the Derelict Saga, combines military sci-fi, space opera, mystery, and suspense to create a journey you won't forget. Podcast available at shadowpublications.com. Paperback and ebook available from amazon.com. Some mysteries shouldn't be solved. All right. Now, enough about them, and let's go back to talking about Jason. So, Jason has written many series, so this is where we're going to list them out for you. He's written the Freehold series. I know. It's a long list. The Warp (laughs) series. The Kaiju Apocalypse Novella Trilogy with Eric S. Brown. The Ken War Saga. The Homeworld series with Eric S. Brown. (gasps) Deep breath. The Dead of Babylon novella, which was standalone. The Kraken Mare, which was standalone. The Murder World, Kaiju Dawn with Eric S. Brown, which was also a standalone. He has written the Mental War Echoes of the Past anthology. He has a short story there. What Scares the Boogeyman anthology. The Terror by Gaslight anthology. Shada Pons anthology. Dreams of Stream Four anthology, Shada Facets anthology, Dreamers in Hell anthology, Hero's Best Friend anthology, which looks really neat. Uh, if you read the bio, it focuses on the animals, which is always cool because I'm, I'm an animal kind of guy. Um, so the Lawyers in Hell anthology, which is basically <laughs> called Modern Reality, Forged in Blood anthology, the Black Tide Rising anthology, the Good, the Bad, and the Merc anthology, which is in the Four Horsemen universe. <sighs> And a fistful of credits anthology. Man, that list was long. And if I listed his non-anthology short stories, I'd still be reading. Yeah, you missed a couple. I was going to say, I'm like, I I missed one, missed one. (laughs) Yeah. So he has a list on his website, which will be listed in the show notes, of all of his anthologies. And he separates them by series, um, by anthology, and then just the standalone short stories that have been published. And it's an extensive list. And so go check it out if you're interested. But while all of those books sound amazing, we're going to focus on that lit RPG series we've talked about. That's right, the Warp series. So we've talked about what it is, but how did you come up with the idea or premise for the series? Was well, it psychedelics, Ouija board, 
did you you know get the good sugar at the diner what's up um well actually this is a hilarious hilarious little thing i was really drunk and you'll notice a lot of my books where i talk about them start off with i was really drunk <laughs> i was really drunk and sitting in my living room it was like two three in the morning i couldn't sleep i don't even remember why i couldn't sleep i just couldn't sleep and i was watching tv and there was this science fiction movie on and i'm just staring at it it's not registering i, I see japanese director polish science fiction movie i'm like this is gonna be weird <laughs> and then it turned into this awesome show about lit rpg and it, i was i was blown away with it because they did some graphics and some shots in it that i was just like wow that's cool and uh if you're ever in it, it's called uh i think it's called avalon and it's an old polish science fiction movie from like 2000 maybe 2003 somewhere in there and that gave that combined that with uh travis taylor's uh quantum connection when he mentions the realm bore out of this horrible lustful incarnate it became the warp what was the Travis Taylor's book? Uh, the Quantum Connection. Okay, we'll I'll have to have that it, in the show notes. It was his second. It was his second book. It's a. It's like I said. It's not his best, but it's got some of his most creative science in it that I, that makes sense. Okay, I'll check oh. it out. So, all right. So, what were you drinking? Anything good? Uh, ah, trying well, to get him to remember. That, no, yeah. I was thinking was that was that the night when I was doing the shots because I was bored, or was that the night I was celebrating because I I don't even know it was it was so long. Ago. Okay, well then let's ask you a more fundamental, important question because uh, one of the friends of the show is Tim C. Taylor, who is from the United Kingdom, and it's weird because he drinks his beer funny and warm. So how do you drink your beer? Uh, there I is a right like answer. <gasps> I don't like beer. That is not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're too committed now. We're over half an hour into this, so you can't kick me out. <laughs> oh. Did they, is that why you got out of the Navy? They kicked you out for not drinking beer? I, I bet that's it, no, isn't no. it? No, 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 no. They, um, no, I, I just, I don't like the taste of beer. I don't get it. It's something physical. I, you give me hard alcohol, I'm your man. We'll sit there. We'll pound those all day. Mm-hmm. What people do to six packs, I'll do to a fifth of, of, of vodka. I just, you know, Ew. I just don't like beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So the Warp series is clearly a series. I know this because I can read titles and it says the Warp series, book one. So uh, where do you see this series going? You're two books in already. So now what? Uh, it's going to end at four books. It's a one overall overarching plot of my heroine uh, pretty much trying to save the world. Although she doesn't even realize it in book one that she's trying to save the world. She's just trying to save her friends in the first one. Okay. She doesn't realize what's at stake until the end of the second one without spoiling too much. Uh, that's when she realizes it's not just the game. It's the world that's at risk. Okay. So <laughs> when that character arc of four books ends, are you done with the world and moving on? Or yeah. are you going to tell more st- stories in that world? I'm I'm done with it. It's uh, there's really nowhere else she can go from there, just because of the way it's it's working out and the way for Tori, the main character, the way it is. It's just even if I did continue the series, it wouldn't be with her as a character. Okay. okay. Now, could you foresee yourself telling other lit RPG stories? Oh yeah, yeah. That's it's such a fun genre. It's I, I like I said it before. I would like to write for some of the other uh, gaming companies out there. I would love to do that. Just as they have so much creative material already. All I got to do is take what they've made and put a little spin on it. And it something tremendous. So if Halo sure. books is listening, uh-huh. you, uh, you'll take their phone calls. Oh, if, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. I mean, I've read some, some really good books, um, out there. I'm reading right now, Karen Travis, I think is her name that did the, um, Oh, the Clone War books, the Star Wars stuff. So, uh, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of room to have fun with existing canon and adding your twist to it in existing worlds. So if you were writing in any video game world that's out there, um, which one would it be? Um, well, 
what I don't know because you have what I would love and what would make me the most money. Well, you answer both. Okay, uh, most money I'd ride in the Eve or uh, Eve Online universe. Oh, okay. Those are the most. They are the most diehard fans I've ever seen of any video game whatsoever. Like I, they spend. Re- I'm talking like real money, not twenty dollars here or there for microtransactions. I mean real money on a game where they can actually create their accounts from scratch and turn around and sell it for like fifty thousand dollars in real money. That, okay. <laughs> That's also the one with the most risk of backlash, though, because, you know, if I mess something up, they will come at me hard. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. And you get what's the other one? Toast. Um, I've, personally, I would love to write in the Star Wars universe. That's my personal love. I would not, – not the new one. I'd rather do the Legends just because that was, that was what I read, you know, uh, Kevin J. Anderson's Jedi Academy trilogy or series. Uh, just stuff like that would be a lot of fun. Uh, I could do Halo. Uh, World of Warcraft would be neat. Um, and then, of course, Warhammer 40k. That would be pretty cool, because then I can get really grim dark. Hmm. Yeah, but their fans are... Better be exactly right. Oh, they're picky, yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, what... Um, what... <sighs> What is it about Halo, since that's specifically a video game, and we're trying to keep this lit RPG focus? And if we sound like we're all over the place, it's because we're all learning together, people. So send your comments and your hate mail to Chris at um, – <laughs> seriously. But if you've got any corrections you want to send us or any of that stuff, we are definitely down to make this even better. We'll do a correction episode. You know, just just reach out. But uh, what is it about Halo and the other video games? And Star Wars counts because they've got video games. Um, are there Warhammer 40k video games, or is that just tabletop? Yes, there are. They're, uh, they have an online game. They used to have okay. a fantasy game online, and then they've got they their, have... uh, they've got this new one. Uh, it's a Total War now, Warhammer 2. It's a fantasy one. But they, they've really branched out over the c- past couple years, and they've gotten into the video games. And they're tremendous games, too, actually. I've played the um, the turn-based little phone app one, but it didn't hold my interest for long. For Warhammer, no, they have a they had like I said they had a, a, a they had a lit RPG world uh, for oh. a while there. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, it still might be out there. I don't know, but it was it was pretty interesting. But you know, I mean, at that point, it was getting oversaturated in the market with fantasy RPGs online. It's just you know, you had Lord of the Rings online had just come out. You had you know World of Warcraft Ultima Online was still hanging around. And then you had this one, and I can't even name them all. There's so many. So, w- w- <laughs> hmm. So, if you were going to throw your character in any one of the the online video game worlds, and money wasn't an object, and you were approved for all of them, where would you start? Hmm. Oh boy. Um. Ah. Uh, well, the uh, Tori likes her guns, so <laughs> okay. Uh, it's yeah, it's really she likes her she likes her guns. So it boils down to: Do I put her in Halo and let her go nuts with all the with the Warthog and all the toys that they have in that game, or yeah, you know, I think it'd probably be science fiction. Cool. Yeah, I, she likes I, I'm, I'm sort of drawn. I used to to do more of the fantasy when i was younger but now i tend to focus more on science fiction because i don't know i just the guns they feel comfortable it's like the world we have now but different enough that you can explore things but um but yeah okay i could see that the halo has a lot of neat toys so if you would uh if you were writing if you were taking the modern character and that's lit rpg as i understand it is when they go into the video game so if you were going to take a, a modern character would you throw them into the master chief spartan armor or would you make them a, a regular grunt how would you torture your character if you were throwing them into the video game um i don't know if you've seen the short or not short film but the film based on halo called forward unto dawn i have i wrote a book game. review on it uh, or a yes. movie review I actually really liked it. I thought it was very well too. done. And I would take one of my characters and put them over at that OSD at the okay. school. Oh, cool. In the I middle of that the, landing. 
I love the uh, ODST. Like they're the the hell divers. Yeah. Feet first into death, all that. I love that. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that's that's cool stuff, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Your your character, if you throw a real live uh human into that, they would probably hate you. But Yes. But it'd be compelling. It'd be interesting. <laughs> the reader would like it. It would. I, I've always wondered like what happens to these characters. Um, my son was playing a video game and I don't even remember what it was. He had earned his, uh, he, it behaved. So we let him play and his babysitter was telling him like, Oh, don't be mean to that person. What if that character comes out of the game and gets you while you sleep playing with them? So I've always wondered oh. that could be like a, an interesting twist. Like your characters come to get even like you SOB. What did you do to me? Kind of thing. I, I just, that could be a fun, a fun twist is what if they come for you later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree. That's pretty twisted. <laughs> yeah, I would read that. Just throwing that. Just I don't know if you guys are busy right now writing books, but you know, I would read that. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be interesting. We'll have to. We'll have to talk about that one offline. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've always liked the um, the where they take the side characters and then they just sort of make it their own as opposed to taking the main canon. I like it when they play on the, on the periphery, when they do the, that stuff. But yes, anyway, definitely. We, we could drag this out all day, but um, I'm getting the look from Chris. Uh-huh. That's right. His look is so strong that he was such a good Marine Sergeant that I can see it through my monitor. Yeah, that's right. And we're all in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we ask all of our authors who were also military veterans, veterans, this question, but how do you feel um, that your time in the Navy affects the stories you tell? Uh, it definitely affected my sense of humor. I had, yeah, mm. being around Navy people all the time, it just your, your sense of humor changes and you become more uh more apt to just say what's on your mind and less filtered and coming back into civilian life it was very difficult uh reapplying the filter right because yeah, people get so offended mm-hmm. and, they, and, and they don't know you're playing because you're used to playing that way yeah <laughs> and the gallows humor sometimes sometimes messes with people yeah yeah hmm. <laughs> it's it's like my they would talk about my uh like a friend of mine got shot when we were in Bosnia and they're like, Oh my God, is he okay? I was like, ah, you know, he didn't need that knee anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Do do you ever find yourself drawing, drawing characters or situations from things or people you knew that, uh, in the Navy? Yes. All the time. And I I'll catch myself when I'm reading it later. I'm like, wait, this guy sounds really familiar. (laughs) <laughs> and I'll have to go, I'm like, oh no, I just, oh, uh, are you kidding? Me? Oh, I just wrote this person in. Like, I've got to yeah, change a couple of things much. so I don't get sued. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a book uh, about one guy, uh, this a marine character I knew. I mean, he was literally a character. Uh, the very first gay marine I ever met in my life. It was very strange. Mm-hmm. And he was such a psych, a psychotic like. Okay, I'll just jump in at fifteen thousand feet. We'll go ahead and we'll do an airborne drop. I was like, dude, you're a marine. That ah, don't matter. I'm like, wow, hmm. you're a nut. Huh. And then he ended up writing a whole book about the guy. And then I didn't realize it until that came out that I just based it on this guy I knew when I was in the Navy. <laughs> cool. Hey, whatever it takes to get inspiration. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is the point in the interview where we say enough about your books, Jason. Geez, shameless plugging is over. <laughs> so <laughs> what uh, what lit RPG books are you reading at the moment? Uh, well, I just finished Controlled Alt Revolt. Uh, Revolt oh, me. I loved it. Um, oh, it was fantastic. Uh, Soda Pop Soldier. Yeah, I guess it would kind of fit into that, but it's a little after that. Um, you know, I read, I read Ready Player One. I kind of enjoyed it. Um, hmm. it, it wasn't the greatest. I just, uh, oh, uh, Snow Crash. Oh, Snow Crash. What's that? Great. Yes. That's another one that, uh, is a lit RPG. I would say it's the first one. Oh, yeah, okay. that's, that's true. I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, I would say that was the first lit RPG book out there. And it, it's not even its own genre, you know. It's it's fascinating stuff. I, I, I can't forget that line where he talks about his car being powerful enough to shoot a pound of bacon into the asteroid belt. <laughs> that it was <laughs> so great. Who thinks like that? 
Apparently, oh. Manny likes his bacon. Oh, gosh. Just <laughs> amazing. Great book. So I have not read any of those, although I, I just recently purchased the Control-Alt-Revolt, and I was going to give it a shot. But, um, man, I feel like every time I talk, I, I've said, oh, I'll add that to my TBR. And I go over to Amazon, and I buy a book, and I'm like, I could potentially die before I read all of these. <laughs> so... And then I had a mm-hmm. moment of sadness because I realized if the apocalypse comes and the internet goes down because they're all digital through uh, through Amazon, I don't know that I would have my books anymore. Yeah, that's why I buy both the Dead Tree version and the ebook version. Um, I mean, if I had enough room to store all the Dead Tree versions that I have on my Kindle, I guess if the end times comes when the zombies come for me, I will be holding up in this in the library. <laughs> yeah, you might have bigger I things to worry about. They've got the good stuff. <laughs> nah <laughs> nah all right so um are there any because one of the things we always ask is if there are any scientific breakthroughs that you're following because we like to talk about the science that is the science fiction so uh is there any of this anything scientific uh technology wise or whatever that you're following that that uh, they get excited by uh quantum teleportation oh hmm. like quantum entanglement i've been following Yes, mm-hmm. I've been following that lately, and I, I'm really hoping that I see it before I die. Or be, or that, well, of course, I see it before I die. I hope it, it comes to fruition before I die, because I would love to be able to just like teleport from here to California to see my dad real quick and come right back. No TSA, no nothing like that. All right. What about you, uh, Chris? Any of the scientific technology you're you're enthralled and drooling over? Yeah, actually, but I want to mention – First, real quick, that I know a, he might be 16 years old now, who is actually on his way to making quantum teleportation a thing. He graduated high school a couple of years ago. He's in college right now, and he actually has access to IBM's supercomputers, where there's only about a dozen people who do, and he's able to run his algorithms on there, and he wrote a couple papers on quantum teleportation. So that could be coming, I'd say, within the next 20 years. Okay, like we needed to sleep at night. Right. So, so the, uh, but the scientific thing that I'm following right now, I found an article on express.co.uk that says Dr. Michio Kaku is worried that robots will have the potential to become dangerous human killing machines and will go into a murder, murderous rage unless precautions are taken. Uh, Dr. Kaku says that the solution will be to create robots with a little chip or something inside their whatever their brains are in order to keep them from, from expressing these, uh, these hostile actions. He also is pretty sure that within the next 20 to 50 years at the most, that the robots are going to become smart enough with their AI that they can overcome these chips. And we're eventually going to have to surrender to them and integrate if they allow us to live. Wow, that's dark. <laughs> yeah. Normally, he's such an uplifting guy. Normally, he is, but he does not like the the potential for robots and AI and and the world coming to an end. Interesting. We that's one of our uh, our dream guests. We, we would love to get him on the show. Mm-hmm. It could happen. He's a good. He's a nice guy, from what I hear. Yeah, he's super smart it. too. So, so what are you following, mm-hmm. Jer? Well, it looks like SpaceX is at it again uh, with another launch uh, less than two weeks after their Heavy 9 Falcon um, launch. They sent a bunch of satellites into space. You know, nothing special for these phenoms of the void, um, which was an article from MSN.com technology um, news feed that I was just happened to be browsing. Uh, on my lunch break and it was super interesting. So I'm curious to see where SpaceX goes. So I've been sort of keeping an eye on them. And, uh, and of course, Chris would love to talk to uh, Elon Musk. So, you know, if he's listening, if he's listening, us. we'll make room for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so we've been following the the whole uh, space race to Mars and all of that. Um, I'd love to ask all of these people why Mars and not start with the moon. But, you know, we'll have to grow the show a little bit to have those conversations with them. That's right. But we, 
we have reached the end of our podcast for the day. So Jason, you want to tell listeners how they can find you? And as a reminder, all of these contacts will be in the show notes. Well, uh, you can always find me at www.jasoncordova.com uh, at uh, on Twitter with at Warp Cordova on Instagram at Warp Cordova. And then I have a Facebook author page. People can follow me there too. Outstanding. And what about us, Chris? Where can they find us? Our website is www.sfshenanigans.com. Our Twitter is at SFS, that's Sierra, Foxtrot Sierra underscore show. And our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time, where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. Boom.